Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Mary Ann Hensley, and I'm the Vice President of Marketing here at FreightWaves, and I'm excited to be here and happy to present today's webinar in partnership with Redwood Logistics, one of the nation's fastest growing logistics providers, which is fueled by industry-leading technology and a passionate team of experts who deliver next-generation solutions for the freight industry. I am thrilled to be here today with Jordan Dewart, who is the Managing Director for Redwood Mexico, to talk a bit about the cross-border shipping climate, including some of the challenges that companies are facing and how they can work to navigate those challenges and ensure they are capitalizing on their cross-border shipping efforts. Jordan will take the stage first to share some insights on some of the key challenges that companies are facing, and then we'll follow that with a dialogue to dig a little bit deeper and take some questions from those of you listening in as well. Before we get started, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. First, if you have any issues during the webinar, please feel free to reach out to our team via the chat function on your Zoom control panel. Also, if you have questions that you'd like to ask Jordan, please enter those through the Q&A box in your control panel and we'll take as many of those questions as we have time for before closing our session today. We'll also be sending a link to the recording of this webinar, so if you'd like to view it on demand or if you'd like to share it with your peers, uh, you'll be able to do that as well. And at this point, I would like to go ahead and turn it over to Jordan. Thank you very much, Marianne. I really appreciate it. And thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, I've teed up some slides to provide some talking points for our conversation today and, uh, and look forward to going over these with you. Um, this is our, our, our agenda for this afternoon. We'll look at uh, some maybe political, demographic, economic information in Mexico. Um, what's driving the economic boom that's happening in Mexico today? Uh, what I call the perfect storm of capacity issues. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more specifics about the cross-border process and what transloading means at the border. And then finally wrap up with uh, some suggestions on how we can avoid some of the peaks and valleys of the drive in cross-border shipping. Uh, first of all, a, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm uh, from Canada originally. Uh, as a young man, my grandfather sent me down to study in Mexico, uh, and I just absolutely fell in love with the country. I found a place where it doesn't snow uh, nine months of the year, and just really just decided to, uh, to stay on and, and make a go of it down there. That was right when the NAFTA was kicking off uh, in the early 1990s. So I started a cross-border trucking company, which was eventually acquired by the NYK group and stayed on to uh, run NYK Logistics and, and use in logistics. And I stayed there for, for over 20 years. Uh, I left there and joined uh, Redwood team this past year to start up their Mexico division. Uh, and I'm really excited to be a part of a dynamic growing company uh, and working with all of their excellent cu uh, customers and then dealing with their cross-border needs. So in my career, I've really had a chance to, uh, to live in Mexico for over 20 years, understand in-country what it's like, the shipping challenges in all the different modes from rail and truck, uh, cross-border warehousing and customs brokerage, and air and ocean forwarding as well. Uh, so, so I'm here as a resource to, uh, to help you with any of your needs that you might need. Um, so let's jump in a little bit to the you know, current political and economic overview of the country of Mexico. So Mexico is growing in population uh, now at about 130 million people. Uh, they're also growing in GDP uh, last year around 2.3% and, and projected to grow even further than that and perhaps more than the U.S. economy in 2019. And unemployment uh, remains very, very low. So a lot of opportunity for the middle class jobs in Mexico. Um, we have a new president in Mexico, uh, Andres Manuel López Obrador, uh, who came on uh, as, as a populist uh, and then a lot of concerns and fears about how that would affect the Mexican economy. Uh, but, but really, we haven't seen any negative impacts to his presidency as of yet. And just in the first couple of months of his presidency, he's had a lot of challenges uh, from a self-inflicted fuel shortage in central Mexico uh, trying to crack down on corruption in January, but now uh, fully under control. Um, he's someone that uh, is considered to be very business friendly. Uh, and his first key challenge was uh, a teacher strike where they shut down the Puerto Mexico Toluca rail ramp, uh, but was also able to to step in and, and show his flexibility and assist with uh, with setting that off. So. 
Um, still a lot more to come. We have a six year uh, term to come, but uh, so far so good, as they say. Uh, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't mention also on, on this side of the border, um, you see in the headlines every day, the, uh, the wall being built, but really don't anticipate any major effects on the Mexican economy itself. Um, and, and as I mentioned, we, we really forecast uh, business growing in, in Mexico over the next year. Um, we have a new NAFTA agreement. In fact, it's not called NAFTA anymore. They replaced it, named it the United States and Mexico Canada Agreement. Uh, it still doesn't quite roll off the tongue as, as NAFTA does, but uh, very, very few changes to this, this massive agreement. And um, when I was in, in college, I took a course on the NAFTA, and the first day the professor told us the NAFTA and is not a free trade agreement. A free trade agreement is a one page saying there will be free trade between all parties. Uh, and the NAFTA is about three or four inches thick, covering uh, how many different things. So uh, very, very few changes to the NAFTA agreement. So that's good news for us. Um, supply chains that are in place uh, anticipate to move forward smoothly. Um, Mexico remains to be a very great place for, for foreign investment. Um, 2012, it occupied the 14th largest economy in the, in the world. Uh, currently, they've moved up to the 11th largest company, uh, economy in the world, jumping over countries like Spain and Australia. Um, and Goldman Sachs is projecting Mexico by 2050 to be in one of the top five economies in the world, just based on their proximity to the United States and competitiveness uh, within the country. They have currently uh, free trade agreements with over 50 other countries around the world, including the United States. And when you talk about a global place for foreign investment, uh, Mexico is that place. So a lot of foreign companies want to get access to the, to the United States market, and they're investing in Mexico uh, to do so. Uh, when we talk about this economic boom, you know, a lot of people ask what's, what's driving it. Clearly, uh, there's technology and healthcare industries, general manufacturing, things like appliances, electronics, as I mentioned, but uh, the main thing is automotive. So the US, the big US automotive, big three, you know, Ford, Chrysler, GM, they've been in Mexico for, for over 50 years. But what's new are uh, countries like uh, Japan and Korea and from Asia, and on the European side, uh, you know, Mercedes, Saudi, BMW, Volkswagen, making renewed investment. Uh, so I've listed off some of the key uh, investments I've made just, just in the last few years, uh, all over one billion US dollar investments. Uh, so that means a lot of uh, cross-border shipping of auto parts and, and finished vehicles. So uh, this has been good news to the Mexican economy, and it's one of the things that they'll want to address in free trade agreements going forward. Um, towards the bottom, you, you see a lot of companies getting into the Mexico market for the very first time because they see a lot of opportunity for their foreign direct investment. Um, but we see them running into issues in Mexico as first time shippers, you know, they, they run into capacity constraints. Uh, clearly there's security concerns, cross border shipping uh, that, that, that remains. Um, there's a big demand for new services like intra Mexico, uh, container depot drainage, uh, different things within the country of Mexico that they'll need to support automotive logistics things. Um, there's a currency conversion from both European, Asian, and the U.S. and Mexican peso uh, concerns for everybody as this foreign direct investment grows and grows. Um, well, Mexico has done a lot of things to really increase their uh, university attendance. Um, there still is a, a lack of very highly skilled labor in Mexico. So uh, as they grow, these are some of the growing pains that they're, they're going through. And the Mexican government has also realized that there's, there's a great need for investment in infrastructure uh, from the highways, the airports, uh, the ocean ports and different things. And they've, they've really stepped up just, just in the last couple of years. They've basically doubled the output of uh, the Ambassador Cardenas Ocean Port. And currently underway is uh, an additional two lanes to the Pan American Highway between Monterey and Laredo, Texas, uh, covering almost 100 kilometers of uh, hydraulic concrete, about 50 centimeters thick. So uh, Mexican government is stepping up to, uh, to meet the challenges of this uh, infrastructure need. Part of the meat of this uh, webinar today is to talk about capacity constraints. And, and one of the questions that I get asked very often are, you know, what, what's driving this? 
uh, these capacity constraints. So there's just no trucks. You know, why, why is there such a huge imbalance? So I thought I'd tee up some some points that we've seen over the years and that are current issues and forecasts that would be bigger ones in the future. It's what I call the kind of the perfect storm of factors that are affecting this imbalance and, and frankly getting worse. So, so the first one obviously I have issues in the United States between driver shortages, new hours of operation, and frankly, U.S. carriers uh, can make a good wage without letting their equipment go into Mexico. Uh, so we've seen just recently, for example, U.S. Express in the last month has announced that they'll be pulling out of the Mexican market. You know, definitely a top 10 carrier uh, pulling their capacity out of the Mexico market. So we see that uh, just less, less uh, equipment going into Mexico to begin with. The second is uh, with a very strong U.S. dollar against the Mexican peso, uh, Mexican companies are going to source locally first. It's very expensive for them to buy their raw materials and ship them down into the United States. Uh, so, so less southbound shipments in general from the U.S. Uh, the third, you know, things that are bulk commodities going into Mexico. So Mexico is a country that manufactures things and ships them back to the U.S. So they're importing things like plastic, natural gas, a lot, a lot of uh, raw materials coming in from the U.S. Those are very frequently shipped uh, by rail and by boxcar. Uh, so a lot of that equipment, um, even you think it would be one to one, but the, you can't ship back northbound the finished goods in those same uh, ways that they're coming in. Very closely tied to that uh, is point number four. So we're seeing as a foreign direct investment, they sh start shifting production of uh, manufacturing plants from Asia into Mexico. A lot of the other tier two and tier three suppliers remain over in Asia. So they're shipping all of their inbound uh, raw materials and component parts uh, by ocean containers. So they're coming in through the West Coast, primarily Montanillo, and Las de Cardenas into the central part of Mexico. Uh, but you can't load those containers back uh, northbound. So, uh, so that's another thing that takes away a part of our northbound uh, capacity. And finally, as I mentioned, northbound production and demand for trailers just continues to grow year over year. Um, if you look at the charts of shipping northbound uh, over the road over the last 20 years, it's a steady uh, northeastern uh, chart of, uh, of growth year over year. So across the right-hand side, I've, I've listed you know some of the things that shippers really need to start thinking about, whether you're a company that's been in Mexico for 20 years or 15 years, or, or just you know setting up your factory nowadays, what can you do to, to kind of alleviate some of these issues? You know, for starters, uh, definitely plan on repositioning costs during peak season, uh, especially if, you're, if your factories are located in the northern part of Mexico. Um, there just won't be enough equipment to cover your load, so please start factoring that in. Uh, and on the intermodal side, uh, most of our IMCs and intermodal players have already factored that into their rates, and they're shipping full train load cars of empty trailers all the way far as south as Mexico City. So, so that repositioning cost needs to be factored in. The second is, you know, since southbound loads are coming in at such a premium and they're, they're considered to be, you know, gold to the carriers, make sure you leverage any southbound business you have with your carrier and try and get your, you know, two to one, two northbound for every southbound truck you have uh, because repositioning them to the border or into central Mexico is a good thing for your carrier and you need to, to leverage that. Um, the third thing is you, you really need to consider transloading your cargo at the border. Uh, when I started in this industry, we're moving from the GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, uh, to the NAFTA Agreement. And uh, the best thing since sliced bread was throughput trailers, U.S. trailers being able to cross the border and you didn't have to translate anymore. That's now come full circle 20 years later to, to, to really uh, take full advantage of your supply chain, all of the domestic carrier network and Mexican carrier network. Um, transload your cargo at the border. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, the fourth is to consider your, your truck and rail. And basically what I mean, if you've never considered shipping intermodal, please consider it's a great way to ship uh, to major, many major markets throughout the United States um, and consider you know, in, increasing uh, your participation in your intermodal. Um, the, the fifth, I think you definitely should consider if you've always done business with one trucking company, um, that can be a very risky situation to have all your trucks or all your eggs in one basket, so to speak. Uh, so definitely consider using 
uh, a three PL that can give you a better uh, bite of the entire market and uh, a lot more exposure on both sides of the border. Um, the sixth, you know, review your routing options. Um, we recently uh, had a customer that uh, was shipping heavily to the West Coast, and we were able to give them a solution of routing their cargo over El Paso, uh, which opened up a lot more capacity for them uh, and avoided some of the bottlenecks of going through Laredo, Texas. Uh, and then finally, you know, if you really want to avoid the peaks and valleys, and, and last year was, was a particularly tough year, uh, please consider uh, locking in annualized rate contracts with your, with your carriers. You might miss some of the savings uh, during, during some of the valleys, but you'll, you'll thank yourself by getting capacity secured through peak season uh, and go from there. So um, th those are basically some of the things that we can do to, to alleviate this, this capacity imbalance. Um, I talked about northbound transload, and uh, while this slide may seem to be quite busy, uh, I'll just go through it very quickly, but essentially there's four steps to a, a northbound transload. So instead of a, you know, a, a northbound direct trailer where you have a, a U.S. trailer being loaded in Mexico, pulled by a Mexican truck head, and then that same trailer pulled by a U.S. trucking company on the U.S. side of the border, uh, basically it's just adding one step. So there's, there's four steps to this where it's loaded on a Mexican trailer up to the border, uh, then a crossing carrier crosses that trailer uh, to a cross dock facility in Laredo, Texas. Uh, three, a U.S. domestic carrier is then sourced and put side by side, and uh, your, your cargo is, is cross docked directly from a Mexican trailer into a U.S. trailer, and then it goes on to final destination, final step four. This opens up a lot more capacity within the country of Mexico. Uh, certainly in, in further southern markets that are more difficult to cover. Uh, and it also, after that crosses, it opens up a lot more capacity on the U.S. side of the border. So instead of, uh, you're, you're, if you've got a U.S. trailer that crosses into Laredo, Texas, the only company that can pull that trailer is the owner of that U.S. trailer. If you use a transload model, um, you can use uh, the entire domestic network uh, of, of U.S. trucking companies. So good on both sides of the border uh, and the additional uh, time and perhaps small cost of cross docking the, the goods at the border uh, are, are totally offset by the savings that you would have versus a uh, direct direct load. Um, and finally, as I mentioned, you, you've, uh, you really need to avoid playing the spot market game just like your, uh, your stockbroker will maybe tell you not to be a day trader. We see a lot of, uh, um, you know, big companies that are shipping. They, they want to get into the, the day trade and really take advantage of the lowest possible market rate. Um, unfortunately, we've seen them last year and even the year before that really get burned by not having a stable shipping pattern, dedicated capacity through the entire year. So uh, an annualized contracted rate can really uh, help you with that. Um, th those are kind of the main topics that I wanted to cover with you today. Uh, so, uh, Marianne, if you're there, I don't know if you have any questions or if there's any questions you'd like me to field uh, from, from the audience, uh, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Jordan. That was awesome. You brought up some really good points, um, particularly around the challenges that we're seeing in terms of capacity. Um, can you share maybe some of the other challenges that companies are facing as they look to ship across the Mexican border? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if, if you were to refer back to my slide about uh, the cross docking, uh, and a lot of people have said to me, Jordan, you know that slide's really bit busy um, and hard to follow. And my reply is, well, the reason it is is because in reality it's a really busy and hard to follow process. So a lot of companies, they understand long haul trucking in Mexico, long haul trucking in the US, but they, have, they run into a lot of challenges at Laredo or at the border, which we call the black hole, the black hole of information. So there's a lot of handoffs of information. There's a lot of handoffs of physical documents that take place and a lot of things that have to happen. So, so shippers that wanna go out there and contract the lowest rate of all of these parties often run into a lot of trouble because they have to then follow up with every single party involved in this, in each uh, segment of this uh, very difficult process. So, um, of course, we'd like to, we urge shippers to, to use someone that can offer a one-stop shop 
that can really be, you know, one throat to choke, so to speak, and uh, and, and oversee that entire that process at, at the border. So that's that's definitely a concern. The other one I would say that uh, a lot of companies struggle with is insurance. So you definitely want to ins make sure that your goods are insured on the Mexican side of the border. There are different rules and regulations around uh, carrier cargo liability in Mexico than there are in the United States. And, and we've really seen some shippers say, oh, no, you know, I'm, I'm covered in Mexico. I've got this global policy. But in reality, this global policy that they have um, doesn't cover a lot of things. It has a, has a very different uh, max uh, liability uh, limit and also deductible. So uh, I would urge you to talk to uh, talk to your 3PL about uh, insurance. It's something that's really simple, um, and, uh, and, and we can definitely help you out with that. Great. Um, and then, as you mentioned, and as we know, there is definitely an imbalance of freight coming in and out of Mexico, particularly doing, during certain times of the year, like produce season. Um, and you pointed to some primary reasons for that imbalance, like the driver shortage in the U.S., the strong U.S. dollar, and then obviously the growing demand for northbound equipment. Um, can you share a little bit more about how those factors are affecting cross-border rates and capacity? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what, what we're seeing is, um, you know, carriers nowadays, they're, they're very, very aware of this uh, imbalance. Um, and they wake up every morning with more loads than trucks to, to haul them um, on both sides of the border. So you want to make your freight um, as attractive as possible to move, uh, meaning, you know, make, make sure that you've got uh, a good supply chain transit time built in um, and you know like I mentioned at the end you really want to avoid trying to be a day trader and get to that cheapest possible market rate uh, and get burned through the rest of the year but you know we saw last year for example um, rates don't just go up 10 15 percent I mean they can go up 50 60 percent in certain markets um, we saw large shippers uh, with their freight stuck at the border for anywhere from three to four weeks at a time. Uh, so, so it just really, uh, you know, factory shutdowns and different things like that. So uh, everything goes into pre-planning and, uh, and now is certainly the time to uh, start planning for peak. Yeah, absolutely. And then are you able to share some specific examples of challenges that you've seen your partners address and overcome and what kind of results have you seen from those efforts yeah I mean again I think you want to be build as much flexibility into your supply chain as possible um, so for example as I mentioned um, it's a Luca ramp which is one of the largest rail ramps in Mexico being shut down it's KCS operated ramp being shut down for, for several weeks and, and, and that affects uh, new bookings loads in transit in both directions uh, so we were able to uh, work for two very large customers that we have in one case change the routing to a different rail ramp in Mexico and immediately jump in uh, and find a drain that could continue the movement of freight uh, and the other customer we were able to jump in with, a, with an over the road truck solution for them at a very at a price is very competitive to uh, to intermodal so that was definitely one of the things that we saw so you want to Make sure that you're always considering intermodal. You're always considering uh, different options, uh, so that when emergencies happen, you can jump into those different modes quickly. Uh, the other was, uh, as I mentioned, a uh, very large northbound shipper coming out of central Mexico that was just running into bottlenecks uh, at, at the border at Laredo. So extremely long lines, difficult crossing, and having a tough time getting loads repowered. Uh, so they were able to shift a lot of their volumes that were going to the West Coast over the El Paso market. And that really opened up a lot of capacity, both on the Mexico side and then truck service and uh, out of the El Paso market. So I think the message there is just really remain flexible. Talk, talk to you know a 3PL that can uh, bring a lot of different shipping options to the table uh, and, and try them, test them out in non-peak uh, and have them ready to go in case you run into any, any issues on the way. Yeah, yeah, definitely good advice. 
And then my last question before we start opening it up to the audience, we've already had several come through, so we will get to those here in just a moment. Um, but just kind of moving forward and looking ahead, uh, what are some of the things that shippers can keep in mind as they look to improve efficiency and reduce risk for their cross-border shipping business? Um, I mean, again, again uh, and we've talked about some of these points, but they are they are really critical and important. So um, on, on the risk uh, side of things, definitely you want to review uh, your your insurance policies and uh, and how your coverage works in Mexico and uh, and the certificates. Please keep them up to date because um, you know one bad example can can really hurt you for for a long time. And uh, you know I, I think it's it's still going on. I'd, I'd like to say that most of what you see in the newspapers and TV is, uh, is just the media, but in reality, these, these things do happen in Mexico. Um, so you can work with reputable carriers. Uh, you can have a very strong supply chain security uh, team in place. You can deal with CT pad providers only, but but no one is, is bulletproof in Mexico. So you definitely want to make sure that you've got uh, a strong insurance plan. Uh, the other is... Um, you know, especially going into peak, uh, make sure that you try and negotiate uh, with multiple partners year-long rates. Uh, get them on board and keep them uh, so they can build supply chains around your supply chain. They can build routes so that you can ensure that you've got inbound equipment when and where you need it. Um, because it, when you live during the valleys, you know, the first couple of months of this year were fairly uh, slow in the shipping industry. Um, don't get lulled to sleep thinking that that's going to continue through uh, April, May, June, and July because we definitely uh, are, are anticipating a significant peak this year, uh, and you want to make sure that you're covered through through those times. Okay, great. And then taking the first question from the audience, uh, Vladimir says, "I've heard about a Mexico law change for taxes payment on." importing into Mexico that'll be effective April 1st, 2019. Now the custom bro customs brokers will not be allowed to do the payment on behalf of the importer into Mexico. How do you think this will impact the customs brokerage process? You know, that, that's, that's a great question. Um, and th they've made a lot of changes uh, to, to the customs brokerage uh, network over the last few years. Um, and they made it all the way up to, you know, uh, almost not even needing a customs broker, you know, making, uh, having shippers being able to pay these uh, by themselves. But, um, you know, I think you will always need that customs brokerage uh, network at the border and in Mexico. We'll always need their expertise. Um, it's, it's not something that you want to try and do yourself and bring in-house. Um, but clearly, you know, the U.S. and Mexican government are cracking down on how money is transferred across the border in all amounts. Uh, so I, I know in the past, a lot of companies have just set up, you know, uh, what they call revolving funds with their brokerage pay, and they've been a little bit too loose with how duties are paid. So um, definitely, I think it's going to have an impact on how people are, are paying their duties and how much money they're going to have to, to set aside. And, and, you know, even in some cases, They've relied on, on 3PLs and brokers to finance their, their duties and tax monies. That that's definitely will go away in the future. So um, companies are going to need to to plan to have that additional capital available to keep their goods flowing. Okay. And then Danielle asks, um, I'm in the surety business, but new to freight. Is there any specific surety bond needed to go into Mexico? Uh, that, that's a that's a good question, and uh, no, no, nope, there isn't. Um, the, the regulations for shipping into Mexico are uh, are you know a, a lot different than they are in the United States. So uh, to to be a three PL in Mexico, you have to have a, a Mexican corporation established, and you have to have the um, object of your company clearly defined in your articles of incorporation. Uh, but aside from that, no, no uh, surety bond needed to operate as a 3PL in Mexico. No. Okay, great. And then kind of an interesting question, but definitely something that I'm sure people face. Um, what commentary do you have about the reality of corruption and bribes in the Mexican transportation market? Is that something that you see impacting business? Um, yeah, I mean, it, 
it definitely is. It was, you know, it, it has a long history, unfortunately, in Mexico. Um, and it, it does have a big impact on trade. And I think it's one of the key reasons that uh, Lopez Obrador was elected uh, in a landslide win in Mexico. People are just really tired of it uh, and how it affects the country being able to advance. So you've got one of the richest nations in the world, but unfortunately corruption has, has played a big toll in, on Mexico. So where, where to start? Um, you know, certainly there was a lot of corruption uh, in the cross-border shipping market regarding customs. Uh, I think they've done an excellent job of cleaning up customs at the border and the inspection processes and, and how goods are imported in. We had a shipper years ago that, um, you know, they had their goods brought into Mexico by paying a little extra to get in. Uh, and after this corruption was cleaned up, they didn't have the correct permits in place to bring their goods in legally. Uh, so, you know, things like that going on. One of the things that we can definitely anticipate uh, Mexican government to, to continue looking at will be um, or the oil and gas uh, business in Mexico and, and uh, Pemex specifically, uh, and, and just looking at the, you know, the theft of gasoline and, uh, and corruption within that organization, that's certainly going to be, be high on that list. Yeah, absolutely. And Douglas says, we work in the RGV, Reynosa Matamoros. Is the Mexican government going to focus on infrastructure improvements there or only stay focused in Laredo? That's, that's an excellent question. Um, I, I believe the biggest project going on in Mexico right now is the highway between Monterey and Laredo. Uh, and while there is there are bottlenecks and whatnot, it, it seems that uh, infrastructure will be focused on that market, on the Laredo market, more than any other one uh, going forward. It's, it's the most natural gateway to the United States. Uh, and, you know, it, it's where all of the current infrastructure is set up. Uh, Laredo, for example, today, if you look at the volume coming through Laredo, Texas, north and south, it's more than every other border crossing point combined. Uh, so Laredo occupies more than 50% of the market. So, so government's going to continue to invest in, in those areas. I'm not, I'm not uh, aware of any specific plans in, uh, in the Rio Grande Valley, but, um, but I know for Laredo, there will be. Okay, great. And from Pat, uh, where do you see HOS changes in Mexico changing costs for Mexican carriers? That's, that's an excellent, excellent question. You know, Mexican carriers are, while they've been organized through their own cartel called the Canacar for, for many years, they really have not been able to lobby the government very successfully or implement their own fuel surcharge. Um, however, Mexican government is now implementing hours of service. Fortunately, they're, they're still several years behind um, the U.S. market. So, um, you know, with, with new electronic rule changes that have been placed in the U.S., drivers can't just keep two logbooks anymore, right? They have to be compliant. We saw that really hit rates and, and capacity in, in the U.S. In Mexico, they've just now start launching the hours of service regulations um, and those companies that are compliant and you know as a US shipper you want to deal with a Mexican trucking company that is compliant we can expect that to to affect rates the issue will be that those carriers that are non-compliant will, will keep pressure on the rates um, in the other direction so what's going to have to happen and quickly is for them to go to a, a fully electronic uh, solution for hours of service of Mexican drivers and, and I think they'll be able to implement it um, just because the scale is so much smaller. So I, what I foresee is um, a little bit of, uh, you know, issues up and down, a little bit of a roller coaster ride in rates on the Mexico side. And then once it's finally implemented, when the electronic rule changes come in, I think we can all expect a pretty significant rate increase on the Mexican side of the border, something to the tune of 10 or 15 percent across the board. Yeah, right. And Jacob says, uh, with the increase of traffic coming out of Mexico, do you see there being a plan in place to make crossing more efficient? You know, that's that's an excellent question. That's definitely like what, what we would uh, all hope to have happen. 
Um, you know, there, there's no major rule changes planned for the, for the NAFTA agreement. Um, you know, they continue to, to try and push forward CT pad and things like the fast lane. Um, but, but really, they've been unable to turn that into real transit time improvements. Um, one thing that we're experiencing with, and, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it, is to alleviate both um, you know, U.S. driver shortage, um, they've opened up what's called the B-1 visa program for Mexican drivers. So a Mexican driver can do the border crossing and then just continue in that truck and drive all the way through. So it's a truck that has both U.S. and Mexican plates and a driver with a U.S. visa that's able to drive on both sides of the border. So that really helps the handoff at the border and, uh, and really shortens transit times. We're currently operating a large scale uh, export program out of Monterey up to the Tennessee area. And uh, with team drivers from door to door, we're averaging like 30 to 32 hours uh, from Monterey into Tennessee now with dedicated teams on both sides of the border, but they're able to really bypass any handoffs at the border. So as that, that program won't have a huge impact on the market overall, just because there just aren't enough drivers, but things like that, US government making it easier and, and more attractive for Mexican drivers to come in, I think that'll, that'll really help in the future. Okay, great. And then Tom asks if you are able to go into a little detail on the Mexico oversized overweight permit process. Um, and he points to an example about how permits are not issued until freight is, in, or until freight is inspected and on the trailer. Correct. Um, that, that is, while we do operate a lot of projects into Mexico, um, that, that is one that I have a, a high level knowledge of, but um, all of these permits that they issue in Mexico, different than they would in the US. In the US, they issue them at a, at a corporate level, and in Mexico, uh, for things like hazmat and oversize, overweight, over dimension cargo, uh, they issue, the, as, as the uh, listener says, they issue them at the time of crossing. The reason they do that is that permit is tied to the trucking company and to the specific trailer and to the driver uh, that's on it. So without all knowing all that information ahead of time prior to the, you know, the load actually crossing the border, um, companies are not able to get those permits. So that's one of the major holdups that they run into um, in that. So definitely um, on over-dimensional cargo, aside from the slow transit time anyways, due to the speed limits, you know, you have to factor in at least one to two extra business days at the border just to get all of these permits in place. Yeah, great. And then are you able to provide some insights um, around the best way to avoid theft in transit to the border or at the border when waiting for a clearance to go into the U.S.? Um, yes, uh, as I mentioned, the, 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 first of all, step one is insurance because the, the quote unquote bad guys are always one step ahead of you um, in everything that you're doing. Uh, so step one is having a comprehensive insurance program in place. But definitely the, the next things on the list I would, I would add would be you want to deal with the most reputable carriers. Um, you want to deal with carriers that have uh, truck yards throughout Mexico. Um, so that whenever that tr truck is not moving, it's at a secure CT pad facility, um, and it's you know it's got cameras, lights, uh, fences, and, and security guards around it. You want to always keep uh, on your transit times in Mexico. You want to keep a seal history. So what seal did it have when it when it left the factory? What seal did it have when it arrived at the border? When it went through customs process and when it arrived in Laredo, Texas. So it's really critical to have uh, a seal tracking history. Um, you can keep it in an Excel spreadsheet as simple as that, or you know, in, in a more sophisticated manner. Um, you wanna use the bottle type seals, they're called, that, that, that lock or bolt seals. And uh, seals are not expensive. So go ahead and get them made up you know, with your company logo on and, uh, and a specific color so it's not easy to duplicate those seals because um, if you're using a, a plain white seal, uh, that can be duplicated in, in a matter of hours, uh, cracked and put back on. 
Um, for, for very high value cargo, sensitive cargo, you want to look into having a, uh, a security escort uh, that goes along with it. Um, not an armed escort, uh, but just someone that uh, is aware with it, um, accompanies the vehicle and uh, can notify authorities in case it were to happen uh, very, very quickly. Uh, in addition to that, all you, know, you want to use carriers that have GPS and satellite tracking in the truck. Uh, and you also want to have that in the trailer as well. Uh, so that, you know, heaven forbid the truck and the trailer uh, become separated, you can you can keep uh, an eye on both where both of those are. But frankly speaking, we've seen some that they're very advanced uh, in, in their ability, the bad guys are, and uh, to to shut off GPS and to intercept things quickly. So, um, but those are some of the key things I think people can do to to avoid loss and risk. Yeah, and just kind of a follow up to that question um, that was sent in as you were responding. Um, it says. It seems we're having issues where doors are even being removed, seals with seals intact, and with that still occurring. Do you have any thoughts on how to limit that? It's it's difficult. Uh, it's difficult to avoid that because um, certainly carriers don't like having the hinges welded on their doors. Um, so so that's something you definitely want to avoid. Um, there's there's products in the market. Uh, as simple as uh, types of tape that you can put on the doors that you can see once they've been uh, the, the tape goes over top of the seal of the hinges on the trailer and you can see as soon as they've been removed um, they have seal lock bars uh, that go over top of the hinges as well um, and there's certain types of locking mechanisms where the bolt goes straight into the door after it closes and inserts into a hole into the frame of the trailer uh, and, and can avoid that but um, you know, if, if it if it's something that's happening on a, on a recurring basis, you really want to work with your Mexican carrier partner, um, ensure that uh, you know loads are moved in convoys, that they never stop in route only at uh, you know designated areas, and uh, you know adding that uh, security detail to it, while expensive, will will eliminate shortages very quickly. Yeah, great. And can you explain uh, a bit how cargo insurance works south of the border? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, for example, in our case, in case of Redwood Logistics, um, we can issue through a party, a third party of ours, which is underwritten by Lloyd's of London, a, uh, a security or a insurance uh, certificate on a load by load basis. So we would provide a quotation for you based on the commodity that you're shipping. Uh, and then all we would need is a declared amount of value uh, at the time the trailer is closed at the factory. And then you will get issued um, an insured certificate per conveyance. Um, so it's known as a shipper's interest policy. Uh, and that would cover you all the way through to the U.S. side of the border. And, and we can provide additional insurance on the U.S. side of the border if it's like high value cargo. Um, if there was ever an issue, there are uh, you know, there's deductibles that apply to it, um, and there's different deductibles that would apply in the case of a hijacking uh, versus an act of God um, or, or a traffic accident. Um, but it's uh, it's a very comprehensive uh, you know product, and it's it's quite it's quite inexpensive. Uh, you know, some maybe just a just a, a rough number depending on what the commodity is. Um, of course, it's it's different shipping. You know things that are very low value versus very high value, but you know maybe four hundred dollars for one hundred thousand dollars worth of cargo, something like that. So um, when you think of the alternative, um, it's a very reasonable cost uh, to cover your goods in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Great. And then Elise asks, um, apart from what you've mentioned so far, are there any other qualities or standards uh, we should look for to determine whether a carrier is reputable in Mexico? Yeah, I mean, de definitely CTPAT is considered to be the gold standard in Mexico, and uh, you know, the Business Anti-Smuggling Coalition uh, is another one that's that's very good. Um, and and there's uh, there's versions of CTPAT with, uh, on the Mexican side of carriers. They, they have uh, some carriers have what's called R control, where in addition to certifying the company as a whole, they also certify each individual driver. 
so that, that means that the, there's been a background check and a criminal history check done on each individual driver as well within the company. Those are very good. In, in our case, in, in addition to all of those things, it's absolutely critical that we meet with the ownership of these companies to talk about their, their insurance and I'm sorry, their uh, security protocol and visit their physical truck yards uh, throughout Mexico and certainly in, in you know, Nuevo Laredo or any other area that, uh, you know, uh, that could be prevalent to theft. Uh, so you, you want to uh, make sure that if, if you're not able to travel to their facilities in Mexico, make sure that they provide uh, a large amount of information about their company and, um, and you know, referrals uh, through other, other shippers that, uh, that they've done business with. Okay, great. And then um, Yanira asks, um, is there transloading at the Tijuana and Mexicali borders? Uh, there, there can be, t typically, most of the border crossing points west of El Paso uh, are what we call maquiladoras, which means the factory is just on the Mexican side of the border. So typically when, you know, goods are shipped out of those plants in, in Tijuana and Mexicali, uh, Nogales and, and different parts there, typically what happens is a U.S. carrier has a yard on the, on the U.S. side of the border and you just have a, a Mexican crossing carrier. So the carrier, Mexican carrier will come into the U.S., get that U.S. trailer and just take it across the border, load and then come, come right back. Of course, get in line, clear, clear customs and come right back. Because there's no long haul portion on the Mexican side of the border on the, on the western part of the country, um, there, there isn't that much of a need uh, for cross docking at, uh, at Tijuana or at those, those border crossing points. However, um, I, I think it's an excellent idea, and I know that there are cross dock facilities out there uh, that would allow you to take advantage of the domestic carrier network that doesn't want to let their trailer go into uh, across the border, but doesn't want to have their driver separated from the trailer. Uh, so for a, a relatively small fee of a cross dock, um, especially if the cargo is palletized, let's say 30 pallets per trailer, um, a cross dock taking less than an hour, uh, low, relatively low cost, you really open up your capacity on the US side of the border. So. Um, well, I don't, I don't see it being uh, having, having a huge uh, potential for, for you know, growth. I, I think it's, uh, I think it's a good idea and could definitely help some shippers. Okay, great. And then, do you have any projections concerning rail car or non-intermodal volume and its prospects for the future? Yeah, you know, that, that's an that's an excellent question. Um, every year, I, I attend the, the Gulf Shippers Association meeting um, put on by the General Commerce in, in Houston, Texas, um, and and that'll be coming up in just a couple of months. Uh, so I don't have their the remainder of the year 2019 projection for the car, what we call the rail car shippers, um, but that's a really key indicator because uh, it, it has. Uh, in, in past been able to forecast uh, potential upticks or potential you know downticks recessions in the economy um, but uh, I can tell you up through now up to 2019 where we're sitting today that, that all the projections are for a moderate increase this year uh, so the 2019 is looking like uh, that, that it will continue to be a robust shipping year in the rail car industry okay and with respect to customs clearance, um, is there a reason that DTD transport should not include the transfer piece? Um, he says customs brokerage should cover the paperwork, filings, duties, et cetera, and that could be a separate party. He's curious about your thoughts on that. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a great question. Um, and, and we really like to have you know, 3PL manage all of those steps uh, because very specifically, customs brokerage, customs brokers process paperwork. Um, that, that's what they're set up to do. Uh, and the coordination of the truck is just like an extra step. So while on one hand, um, you know, they know that your customs broker will know hours in advance of when that, uh, that load will cross, um, 
if, if they wait to tell you until yes, now the paperwork's ready, and then you start to look for a, a border crossing driver, it can cost you hours. And if it's late in the day, it can cost you an entire day of transit time. Um, so, you know, just relying on the broker to do it by themselves um, is kind of a hit and miss. Uh, what we do when we manage that entire process is uh, we're, we're working very closely with our customs brokerage team, so we know hours in advance of when that thing's going to cross, and we start pre-planning uh, the, the border crossing. So uh, I think it's it's key to have someone, you know, providing oversight to the entire process because you've got the factory in Mexico providing documentation, uh, the customs brokers on both sides filing entries, um, and if everyone's not doing their job, uh, like I say, it can it can cost you days into a process that really should only take hours. Uh, so in, in our experience, um, it's, it's best to have a third party overseeing that process. Yeah, great. All right, you have been an awesome sport here, Jordan. We'll take just a couple more questions here. Um, for intra-Mexico moves, what identifiers for defining freight responsibility are used most frequently? Um, and some options, um, Cliff mentions are prepaid, collect, or INCO terms like FCA origin, FCA destination. Do you have any insights into that? Yeah, I mean, INCO terms typically only apply to international freight. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so definitely they're, they're more established as prepaid or collect, like he's talking about. Um, but, but certainly the intra-Mexico shipments uh, have the same uh, carrier liability as, as you know, the, the Mexico cross border shipments, which is very little. I mean, it's a, it's essentially something like you know 15 days minimum wage for every metric ton. Basically, it comes out to about a thousand dollars is the maximum amount that a Mexican carrier is liable for cargo. Uh, so while it's attractive to look at some of the rates of you know owner operators within Mexico, or the really small trucking companies. Certainly, with intra Mexico cargo, you you want to deal with uh, with the larger shippers that have established truck yards uh, before you just hand over your freight because there's um, there's very little recourse to go back to the um, to the trucking company on this. So you'd be back, you know, shipping, you know, basically fighting over your uh, your shipper or the person that you're buying the cargo from. So it, I would say an intra Mexico shipment is that much more. Uh, important to deal with uh, with very reputable carriers because you just don't have any international laws protecting uh, you would that you would like uh, with go terms. Yeah, great. All right, we'll take one more question um, for those of you listening in. Um, I saw some late questions come through that we had covered throughout the course of the presentation, um, so we will be sending out the recording to the webinar if you'd like to listen in um, and gain some additional insights. And thank you so much for joining us. Um, last question for you, Jordan. Um, do you have any recommendations of journals or, or other sources to follow uh, to stay up to date on the Mexican transportation market? Um, yeah, that's uh, that's a great question. Um, certainly, FreightWaves is an excellent resource uh, to always go through. Um, you know, we we always stay very closely connected to the Journal of Commerce, both as a periodical and uh, and you know all of their events uh, that they put on throughout the year. I think those are, those are really excellent. In, in Mexico, there's T21, which is an excellent magazine that keeps us uh, up to date. And of course, you know transport topics um, are, are the best, most reputable ones. Um, unfortunately, I, I, I hate to say it, but they, they always say, "What's the difference between good news and bad news?" Uh, good news is usually you, you have to pay for it. Uh, so, so just researching stuff off the internet, off of a free site, is uh, is probably not your best uh, best resource. Um, but of course, I, I'm always uh, available if anybody ever has any questions or, or needs some insight. I'm uh, happy to be a resource. Awesome! Thank you so much, Jordan, and thank you all uh, for 
listening in and taking the time to join us today. We really appreciate our partners again at Redwood uh, for helping to present this webinar. And Jordan, one more time, thank you again so much for your patience, for all of your insights, and for sitting here and fielding all of these amazing questions uh, submitted by the audience. Appreciate you being here so much. And to those of you listening in, we are constantly doing webinars, so stay tuned for what is coming up next. You'll be getting email notifications over the coming weeks, and we'll hope you'll join us again next time. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much. Take care.